For centuries, the Linlithgow Borough authorities appointed someone to make official pronouncements, proclamations and declarations for the benefit of the inhabitants of the borough. These early depictions here come from the cross well, the older one now removed and in the town's museum. The one on the right is a replacement still standing on the well. Announcing news to the whole town was a much easier task when Linlithgow consisted of only one long street stretching from the low port to the west. Linlithgow Bridge was a separate entity some distance from the Royal Borough. The early heralds in Linlithgow were referred to as bellmen or borough drummers. In the days before widespread literacy and newspapers, they were the principal means of communicating with the people of the town and used to announce such events as the death of a monarch, the funeral of a local celebrity, the date of forthcoming events, the declaration of a curfew or the imposition of a new bylaw or tax, all preceded by the ringing of a large bell or the beating of a drum. Linlithgow's bellmen were protected by law from any interference with their duties, as they sometimes brought bad news, such as the announcement that the town council were about to impose a penalty on anyone allowing their chimney to go on fire by not having it regularly swept, or perhaps even more controversially, the, the civic authorities, in order to get cash for repairs to St Michael's Church, were levying a tax of one penny on each pint of beer consumed within the town. Apart from one individual called Tammy Hugh, the names of these early officials are not recorded. However, in the late 19th century, the provost and magistrates appointed Sam Weir as town herald or town drummer and bill poster. Sam was paid two shillings a week for announcing by tuck of drum throughout the borough, such proclamations as when the weekly market would take place at the cross, when the town water supply would be switched off, when a memorial service to mark the death of King Edward VII would take place. The invoice shown on the right concerns Sam posting bills, giving information on refuse collection. Every June, of course, Sam would summon the townsfolk to attend the imminent Marches Day. This early photograph of the crying of the marches shows Sam and his halberdiers in the top right. Sam would be using the words still cried by the town crier of today. Oh ye, oh ye, oh ye, the Baptists, craftsmen, and all inhabitants of the royal borough of Lothgo are hereby warned and summoned to attend my Lord Provost, Baileys and Council, and the ringing of the bells on Tuesday. 15th day of June, for the purpose of riding the town's marches and liberties according to the use and custom of the ancient and honourable borough, and that in their best carriage, equipage, apparel and array, and also to attend all dykes of court held and appointed on that day by my Lord Provost and Baileys, and that under the penalty of £100 Scotch each. God save the Queen and my Lord Provost! Sam Weir was replaced by Tom Collins, who continued to wear the recognisable mock medieval uniform of knee breeches, red stockings, black velvet jacket, silver buckled shoes and a feathered bonnet. He too carried the town drum, as can be seen here at a crying of the marches at the West Port and on the left beside the Whitton Fountain at the Low Port but he is flanked by halberdiers Robertson and Skinner. Tom died in 1937 and his job was taken over by Mitchell Ireland, a former Royal Scot who worked at Loch Mill Paperworks. He served until 1945, but sadly only attended two marches in that time on account of the cancellation of the ridings due to the Second World War. The picture shows him proudly wearing his Great War medals along with the same long-serving halberdiers. Tommy Comer Coburn did much better, officiating at 16 Marches Days. He's seen here at one of his first on the left and at his very last crying in 1962. And here he is fencing the court at the start of the day with a time-honoured refrain. Of the court of the ancient and royal borough of the Lithgow that no person or persons 
assume or take upon hand under whatever colour or pretext to trouble or molest the Burtises in their peaceable riding of the town's marches under all highest pains and charges that after may follow. God save the Queen! Tommy served under six provosts, Ford, Crawford Lamb, Morrison, Thomas, Merker and Laurie. And here are some scenes from the March's days celebrated by these gentlemen. And yet more scenes photographed during Tommy's term in office at St John's Avenue, Linlithgow Bridge, Royal Terrace, and at the cross beside the statue of the Marquis of Linlithgow before its removal. Harry Meenan was next to come marching on the scene. Here he is on parade, emerging from the Kirkgate Arch, leading the provost and council to the palace for the fraternization with the fraternity of Dyers. Harry was so proud of his four year stint that after his death in 1997, his title of town crier was engraved upon his headstone in Brayhead Cemetery. Next on the scene was Sandy Pagan, seen here marching in front of a pipe band in the procession. It would appear as if the town criers were not allocated any special place in the lineup. Early criers were not even mentioned in the order of procession published in the Marches magazines. In the very early days of the Marches, it is likely that the town crier could not read. Consequently, a literate official would read out the legal language of the fencing and the town crier would repeat them to the crowd a tradition that still continues. Sandy served from 1966 until 1973. Here he is about to fence the court for Provost Fergie Byrne, who is standing to the left. In 1974, the very last Borough Council appointed the first and to date only Englishman to take up the post, John Shipton, who lived in one of the very first houses to be built in the new Springfield estate. He was considerably taller than previous incumbents and so needed a new uniform made to fit him. The outfit was humorously blessed by the Reverend David Steele at the Kirken of the Council on the Sunday before March's Day. John is pictured here with halberdiers Morrison and Renton. On the demise of the Town Council, a new organisation, the Court of the Deacons of the ancient and royal borough of Linlithgow, took over the organisation and running of the riding. In its third year of existence, a new crier, John Watson, was appointed, and he fulfilled his duties, duly equipped with the town drum, which had been found languishing in the local housing office. Brief spells of office were undertaken by Deacon Danny Callaghan until Deacon Francie Meenan took up the post, serving for two years under Provost Jim White. Both these men carried out their duties well, from the crying through the fencing to the ceremonies at Blackness, where the crier calls the court to order and then summons the principal landowners to bear witness. The Baron Bailey is then installed, often amidst much hilarity. This was certainly the case during the long reign of Robert Fleming, seen here in jovial mood. The town crier ends the ceremony with the words, this court is adjourned for 12 months, excepting for riots. In 1994, town crier David Duncan took up the challenge. He had moved to Linlithgow in 1968 when his father had been appointed assistant manager of the town St Magdalene's distillery. 27 years on, David is still in post. Although of course, for the last two years, he has not been called upon to make the usual proclamations on account of the fact that the pandemic saw the marches canceled last year and this. We can but hope that changing conditions will allow the marches to resume and that in the not too distant future, the Linlithgow Town Crier's commanding voice will be heard once again echoing down the high street. Long live the marches. <laughs>